Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to be looking at FI and entrepreneurship, and we're going to look at this through the lens of small business. And joining us on the show today is our good friend, Alan Donegan from The Rebel Entrepreneur. Welcome to the ultimate crown source personal finance show. This is Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, guys, very excited to dive into this week's episode. And to help me with this, I have my co-host, Brad, here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. It's hard not to be doing quite well when you have Alan Donegan on the podcast, right? It's uh, hard not to have a smile across your face. So it's been a year since we've had Alan on, which seems crazy. It is. Uh, it's overdue. It's been an extended length period of time. I get a chance to talk to Alan on a very regular basis, and we have missed you, buddy. We've missed you. The community's missed you. And hopefully for those people in our audience that did not realize that you have a podcast called Rebel Entrepreneur, we will rectify that today. Very excited to have you on the show. How you doing, man? Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Jonathan. I am good. I am very happy, healthy. I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And yeah, you haven't really needed me back on the podcast because you gave me my own podcast. Uh, so <laughs> I am a subscriber. Thank you for that. I am a subscriber. <laughs> same, same. So, Tulsa, Oklahoma, your travels have taken you far and wide in the 14 <laughs> months since we've last chatted with you. Tell us what's been going on by you. Since we last chatted, my wife and I went nomadic at the beginning of 2020, right at the start of the pandemic. Uh, we traveled to Thailand and then to the US and then everything crashed and we got trapped in England for five months whilst the pandemic raged the first time. Managed to escape and we spent five months in Germany and then we fled the snow and cold of East Germany and locked down there and went to Mexico and lived on the beach for four months before arriving here in the US to see you guys. So it's been a roller coaster journey, as I'm sure everyone has experienced through this pandemic. Brad, do you remember when like the idea of a staycation was like a cute thing? Hey, normally we go on vacation. Let's just try a staycation this time. But then all of us have been locked into staycation <laughs> mode for like 18 months, just perpetually in staycation mode. Yeah, You're I don't know that in out. <laughs> 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 that did feel like a new term, right? Yeah. Like, oh, it's just cool to end. Yeah, <laughs> kind of a little bit sick of it at this point. But Alan, it's cool that you've, uh, yeah, been traveling so much. So what was your favorite of the handful of places you just mentioned? Well, I have to admit, Puerto Vallarta in Mexico was unbelievable. We rented a place on the beach. The sun set in front of our balcony every single day. There was an infinity pool you could sit in. Like, it was just a different world from the snow of East Germany and Leipzig. Yeah, that sounds like it. Are there any uh, any five lessons that jump out to you and Katie that you could pass along to the audience? Like, you know, obviously many people dream of traveling in the future at some point in their five days, but anything jump out to you? I think there's two that come to mind immediately. One is the power of geo-arbitrage, which basically means your dollar goes a lot further in different countries. So if you go to East Germany, your dollar will go quite far. If you go to Mexico, your dollar will go even further. And there's actually a difference. We spent two months in Puerto Vallarta, which is a beach town that's quite popular, and two months in a place called Oaxaca, which is like the foodie capital of Mexico up in the mountains, which is a lot less touristy. And our money went twice as far in Oaxaca. Wow. It yeah. felt like food was half the price accommodation was half the price. And it is incredible how far your dollar can go when you leave some of the more expensive parts of the US. That's quantifiable. Yeah, that's certainly. Alan, speaking of quantifiable, I know your famous love for tacos. Did you? <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> Hopefully you're doing your uh, your burpee challenge still. Is that uh, <laughs> how are you and Katie staying fit there? 
Uh, Katie joined CrossFit whilst we were wow. down in Mexico and she absolutely loved it. It was 600 pesos for the month to do CrossFit, which is 30 bucks. So you compare that to what it costs in the US and it gives you an idea of the difference. And yeah, we are staying fit, but I have eaten all the mole, all the tlaudas, <laughs> all the tatellas, all of the tacos. Save some for the rest I'm of us. We'll chopping. leave our staycation yeah. eventually. <laughs> <laughs> You should meet me there. I think everyone listening should meet us in Oaxaca and we should have a Choose FI meetup in Oaxaca next time. Eat some incredible food and chat about happiness and financial independence. That would be amazing. You're living the dream, man. But I think that really sets us up, right? I mean, what we want to have today is a conversation uh, that will be beneficial to small business owners and also provide information to people that are on the path to FI that are trying to figure out where entrepreneurship should fit into their plans. And I guess first we'll start with the elephant in the room, uh, the pandemic in the room. You know, this was a tough year for small business. It was a really, really tough year. Uh, and many small businesses that are, are thriving today had to, to some varying degree, pivot, you know, with the, with the changing reality that we all faced over the last year. And so, Alan, I guess in your mind, did this last year, did it change your enthusiasm for entrepreneurship? Did it change your passion for seeing people pursue entrepreneurship? Did it fundamentally change like the ethos of what it is that you're about? So the short answer is no. Uh, the long answer is like the pandemic was knockout for some types of businesses, but with any huge change, there is also huge opportunity. Traditional things get wiped out, but then new opportunity comes along. Who knew jigsaws would be one of the biggest businesses of 2020? Puzzles. Like that when you say jigsaw, expected. jigsaw puzzle? Is that, is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, jigsaw puzzles. Sorry, I'm using Britishisms again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, jigsaw puzzles were huge and crafting indoors. We had a guy called Adam. He runs Craft Box Club and he sends out a box each month. So you can do crafting at home and you can make candles and T-shirts and different things. It's very sustainable stuff he sends out. And his business exploded during the pandemic. So I think it's really interesting. Yes, it was tough. Like no one's denying that. But in any change, there is knockout opportunity in some areas. We just need to find it. Alan, that's the hard part though, right? Is is the mental part, Not maybe not even the finding it, but just like getting over the fear and uncertainty and the doubt, right? Like I hear you say change equals opportunity, but you know, in March and April and May of last year, it seemed like the world, certainly the business world was going to come to an end. How do you get people to believe that? First off, we had to believe it ourselves. <laughs> when that happened last year, every single piece of business for our business was canceled. Every penny of income was gone. We had an event planned with Google at their offices at NYC. We had a diary full of physical events and everything was canceled. So the first step for us was to <laughs> take a deep breath, realize that we had a business emergency fund. And if I could make a recommendation to your audience, I don't care whether you're a business, a private individual, doesn't matter, have an emergency fund because stuff like this happens and it will destroy you if you don't have some form of emergency fund protection. And our emergency fund at the business bought us enough time and breathing space to be able to work out where's the next dollars, where's the next pounds going to come from. And that was our mission, was to take a deep breath, take stock of where we are, and then look for the opportunity out there. Because it's there, we just don't know it's there. And I think that's the part of it. You're just not aware, like, where is this opportunity? It's there. We just got to find it. There's some nuance here that I'd love for you to drill down on just from what you've seen with individuals, because I want to identify there's your business idea, but then there's also the skill set that you build by building that idea out. And that is entrepreneurship, which is not really locked into one particular idea. It's a skill set, you know, that encompasses a lot of varying skills, which you could actually talk through. An entrepreneur probably has these concrete skills that they're, they're building at various paces, but they're all coming together. But I just wanted, I wanted to ask an individual has a business. They have a business model. They've had some success with it. And something like this pandemic just wipes out the need, the demand for the business as currently constituted. So in your case, it was physical events for entrepreneurship. The demand just got wiped out as of March of last year. You were addressing that specifically. Now, there's an interesting fork in the road that go in two slightly different directions. And I'd love for you to kind of tease that out a little bit. 
on the one end, it's how can I pivot my current idea to work inside of the new constraints? And that's kind of what you guys did. And, and you can talk about that. But then point two is I am an entrepreneur that built a business because I recognized a problem and I filled the demand. Do I just take the skill set and build a new business recognizing that there's massive opportunity right now? So I, I'd be curious for you just to think through that out loud and whether or not that's valuable for entrepreneurs to like just give themselves permission to build a new business if their current business model isn't working in current times or whether or not you'd kind of start through how can I pivot my, you know, do you know what I'm saying where I'm going with that? I do. And I think first off is recognizing every single person listening to this show has an incredible set of skills. Like you all do, you just might not realize it. And the classic of this is my wonderful wife, Katie. She worked for Deloitte. She has incredible skills in Excel, numbers, analyzing and data. But she thought that was normal because everyone else around her did it. And it wasn't until she left and entered into a different world. That she was like, oh, wow, actually, like other people really value my skills. And I think if you're just where you are, you don't even realize you have skills. And part of this is what you find easy, other people might not. But then because you find it easy, you undervalue it. It's like, well, it's just easy. That's just what I do. Well, I'm sorry, analyzing data and using Excel spreadsheets is not easy for everyone. Like, you need to realize that. And for me, doing a presentation has become easy because I've practiced at it for decades that's the number one fear out there is doing a presentation. And just because it's easy for me doesn't mean it's not a valuable skill that other people will pay for. So I think all of your audience have incredible skills. Just a lot of them don't realize how valuable they are. Yeah, Alan, that definitely rings true to me. You used that word awareness a couple of minutes ago. And, and I think that's the hardest part. Like you said, when you're in that environment and everyone has those skills, you kind of you don't even realize that, hey, this might be something unusual. Like Katie, with I've seen like her data visualization skills just with like a burpee challenge we were in, which was <laughs> hilarious. Like if she's that good for something that unimportant, like, man, I can't imagine her in a business environment. It was amazing. But like, how would someone, right? So like zone of awareness, like how would someone even be aware of what their skills are sometimes when they're just, it's like the this is water you know, talk that I'm sure you've seen on YouTube, like you're, you're even just unaware that there's water there. You know, you're unaware that it's unusual to have these skills. Like talk me through, like, what would a brainstorming session look like if you were, you were advising somebody like, Hey, what are your skills? Like, how would you get them on paper? How would you think about them if you're not even aware that they're unusual or set you apart? So I think I would have two phases to this. Phase one is the internal phase where you look at yourself and I would have a couple of lists. What do I enjoy doing? What do I feel is easy? What do I find is tough, but I want to get better at? And I would have some lists of the different skills. Then the phase two, I would actually ask people that know me, whether it's colleagues at work, whether it's friends, whether it's whoever. And I say, what do you think I'm good at? Like, where do you see my skills are? And it's a really interesting thing because other people will look at you and go, you're really good at this and you won't even notice it. Like you said about Katie with that burpee data challenge, I'm going to tell her like <laughs> Brad thought this was awesome what you created with that. And she probably doesn't even realize because it's just what she does. But you need someone outside of yourself to do it. So find a friend, find someone who will ask you questions, find someone who will give you some comments about what you're good on. And that's really interesting. And then I would look at those two lists and go, is there any kind of marrying between what I'm good at and what other people think I'm good at? Then we're starting to make a list of like, I've got some skills here. I can do this. Then it's where do you apply them? That's where it becomes really interesting. Right. And yeah, that's kind of, that's the intersection of that concept, like the talent stack that we're always talking about, which is having these skills that you might not be world-class at, but you have a variety of skills that you are excellent. I mean, really top 20%, but not top 1%. But I think people still undervalue themselves. We talked about this on a, on a recent episode. Jonathan was kind of leading me through an exercise like this. And like, I still undervalue some of my skills. Like what you said about, you know, Katie, like, oh, that's easy. Everybody can do that. Like I've had that thought about accounting or tax returns, even though I know definitively because I've been in organizations now for years where it's not easy and it's not obvious to everybody. I still undervalue it because in my mind's eye, 
I'm not a world-class accountant. You know, I'm a very above average accountant, but I'm not a world-class accountant. So like, how would you advise somebody who like maybe has those limiting beliefs or, you know, isn't necessarily world-class at something like, but has this variety of skills? Like how would that person fit into an organization that, you know, it's somewhat nebulous. You know what I mean, Alan? Like it, it's a nebulous set of skills, but taken in totality, it's a fantastic set of skills. You know what I've realized, Brad and Jonathan, is actually there is a low bar for success in life. This is going to sound really weird, but there is a low bar for success, like turning up on time, being able to organize your diary and put the correct time zone in. I'm not talking about anyone specifically there, <laughs> but being able to do these simple things of organize, show up on time, make things happen, structure your thoughts, think on paper, run a meeting, facilitate things. These things that we take for granted, there's a low bar for success because your average person struggles with it. And I think it's realizing, actually, if you can just get the fundamentals and the basics right. And I heard this thing many years ago that 80% of success was just showing up. And at the time, I was quite angry with it. Like, what do you mean 80% of success is showing up? I've been showing up for years. Come on. Like, what, what more do I do? I've been showing up. But it, it's true. Like, showing up on time, doing the stuff, I mean, 80% of the success in financial independence is showing up, learning the stuff, doing the basics of tracking your spending, tracking your net worth, investing in an index fund, creating a gap between income and expenditure. Like it's doing the basics. It's showing up and doing the basics again and again and again. And I cannot underline to people enough, you don't need to be fancy. You just need to do the basics well. Like everyone's looking for that extra edge. And I think the extra edge is in doing the fundamentals really, really well. If I were to look back in an earlier version of myself, I would have said that the word entrepreneurship was a, uh, it's a scary word and it's kind of a black hole of mystery because you don't really know what it actually even means. And even when we're talking about it now, somewhat in the lens of this kind of aspirational goal, I think there are people on the sidelines that rightly so have reservations. Like there's a big space between me now as currently constituted and this person that is an entrepreneur. And there was a huge space between me, you know, five or six or seven years ago. And you know, the entrepreneur that, that I have become over the intervening years. And so I, what I'd like to ask and kind of give you a floor to talk about a little bit is this person has just gone through this level of self-assessment and really everything we've talked about up to this point, this zone of awareness, the zone of possibility, this asking people, what skills do I have? Everyone needs to do that. It doesn't, I don't care if you want to be an entrepreneur or not. It will benefit you just in life to be more aware of what you excel at or what you could excel at if you were to lean in. That's just table stakes for outperforming. Now, this next bit though is who should pursue entrepreneurship? Who should consider this? Does everyone need to consider this? When is it a good idea? When is it a bad idea? I'd love for you just to kind of be intellectually honest and say, Everyone that listened up to this point and is like, yep, yep, you're right. I do need to do that. Do they need to take the next step and go to entrepreneurship? And what is that line of delineation? Well, let's start off with when entrepreneurship is a bad idea because it's not right for everyone. I don't know if you remember way back when I did episode 30 with you on your podcast, which was the power of the side hustle. We got very excited about going out there and building a business debt free, get out there, do it. And I remember the next week I saw a post in the Choose FI Facebook group that you've got. And the guy was saying, I've got three kids. I feel like I should start a side hustle. I think he was making 200 grand a year. He was making really good money in his corporate job. He felt like he should have a side hustle. He actually quite enjoyed his job. He was well on the path to financial independence. And he's like, should I do it? And I wrote in the comments, why do you think you need to do it? Where has this idea come from? Why do you need to do it? You're making good progress. You're earning good money. You want time with your kids. I'm assuming you had kids because you want to spend time with them. <laughs> Brad's like, maybe <laughs> that's assumption. an assumption. Yeah, I don't know. Job. You never know sometimes. But like you start a side hustle, it will take you away from your kids. It takes time. It takes energy. And he actually wrote in the comments, Alan, I listened to your episode and it's your fault. I'm excited about entrepreneurship. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, <laughs> so, uh, but he didn't need to. There was no reason. He likes what he does. He's on his path to FI. There's no reason to. I'm going to push back on that just a little bit. Didn't need to. 
didn't need to. Yeah, you know, that, that individual doesn't need to, and many people don't need to. It's not to say that he, sh- he can't, though, or, or that he shouldn't. He should just be aware of it's not necessary for him to get to financial independence. He might, at the end of that, still want to, and entrepreneurship doesn't have to be about a need. It could be about wants, you know, and so I just wanted to pause there. Clearly, this is a fellow that's conflicted, and it's kind of like, you know, do I sit on the sidelines? Do I not? And I'm glad that you balanced it out. But need doesn't have to be the only driver for entrepreneurship. We can talk about that a little bit later. Well, then I think what we're talking about is on the FI journey, where does entrepreneurship yes. fit? Because it could fit as a tool to get to FI. It could fit as a tool as you've got to coast FI and then you switch entrepreneurship. It could fit as you've got to FI and now you want to do some change and good in the world and then you use it. It could fit anywhere. And I think it depends on what you want to use entrepreneurship for. The assumption is entrepreneurship is about making money, but the real root of the word entrepreneurship is about solving problems. And if you're going out there being an entrepreneur in the world, you're solving problems and you're making the world a better place. And it's just, where does it want to fit on your journey? Why are you doing it? What's the reason? And it's not always a great thing to do. Like building a business takes time and energy. And if you want to spend your time and energy with your kids, with your partner, I am actively trying to stop building businesses, Jonathan and Brad. Like I've got a gorgeous wife I'm nomadic. I can travel around the world eating as many tacos and tolayudas as I want. Like, why do I need another business that keeps me busy? I'm actively trying to avoid building businesses. And it depends where you are and what's going on. So I think it's looking at your own situation and going, do I need to do this? Because we can all get so pumped and excited about doing it. I can change the world. I can change my life. I can make money. Come on. But does it fit in with your values? Yeah, that is so, so important. And that transcends just this conversation, right? That's the FI conversation generally. And the fact that we have the time and space to think about this. This is what we talk about on this podcast all the time, that because we're in such an advantaged position, because we have money saved up, because we're not beholden to that job or that whatever, that they, right? The elusive they. We have the power and autonomy to design our lives as we want. And I mean, you are the entrepreneurship guy on our podcast, right? And you're saying that you're at this point in your life, you've determined that that doesn't make sense for you to start a new business or you're not looking to. And that's wonderful because it's just so intellectually honest and it's where you are in this season of your life. And I think it's really important for everybody to understand that concept of opportunity cost, right? Alan, that's what you're describing with that gentleman who's making $200,000 a year, like opportunity cost is what was screaming to me as you were describing that. And I think I have a a sentence that I have in my head, which I don't think I've properly described to people. It is, what is the cost? There is a cost. You can have anything you want in life if you're willing to pay the price up front and in full. So what's the cost of this thing you want? And to give you an example of this, and I'd love to ask you about entrepreneurship in your journeys afterwards. The example of this is I started joining Toastmasters. I got good at giving presentations. I entered the humorous contest, humorous speech contest. I won a few, started doing stand up. Like it was fun. Like my first ever stand up session was fun. I was so nervous. I sweated so much, but it was fun. And then I was like, oh, I could be a stand up comic. So I joined a stand-up comedian course in London. I started going. And then all of a sudden, I had this realization. I'm traveling up to London and going 90 minutes each way. So it's a three-hour commute to do a five-minute set. If I really want to become a stand-up comedian, I need to do this five times a week. My wife has a full-time job. The time she is off is the evenings, which is the time I would be working. And I had this thought of what is the cost of being a stand-up comic. And the cost is time with my wife. Who do you think won? Well, you're in Mexico eating tacos together, so the the, (laughs) sounds like you made the right choice. (laughs) But does that make sense? So it's thinking about what is the cost? What's the cost of doing these things? And you can do anything you want in life. You can build a business. You can do anything. Everyone listening to this, if you've got a phone, you're listening to a podcast, you're learning, you have the right mindset, you can do anything you want in life. It's just realizing what's the cost? Am I willing to pay it? And if you are willing to pay it, committing to do the work every day and you will get there. It's phenomenal. 
So I'm going to hijack your podcast and ask you questions. Brad, Jonathan, where has entrepreneurship fitted on your journey? Because I think this is really interesting for everyone listening, is it's a tool that fits at different stages of life and everyone's used it differently. So yeah, where has entrepreneurship fitted for you? Yeah, Alan, that's a, it's a good question. It's a really good question. I think it's played an interesting part in my FI journey. I think if I took the entrepreneurship out, I would have had the standard path to FI, the live below your means, certainly never had a six figure or plus salary, but it, you know, I, I made a comfortable living, saved a boatload of money and was well, well, well on my path to FI. I mean, probably 80 plus percent of the way to FI. It's funny because in my mind's eye, I think of myself as just the standard path. But again, if I'm honest, the entire way, I've always had this bug. I've had the entrepreneurship bug. And, you know, for me, it started with the four hour work week, the Tim Ferriss book, the four hour work week, which is crazy to believe that it's more than a decade ago at this point. And, you know, that started this long, circuitous journey of entrepreneurship for me. And it, it was, you know, I, I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I'll give a little summary. It's like filled, riddled with just learning lesson slash failure after failure after random idea and just all the while. And I don't look back at that as like a, a negative. It was all the while I'm picking up skills. I'm learning things. You know, I, I had an idea. I had a potential partnership here. I had uh, literally, Alan, I, you know, thanks to Tim Ferriss, I had a drop shipping website that sold firewood storage racks. Okay. <laughs> I kid you not. I, I have never lit a fire in my entire life or seen one of these items, but yet I had a business on the internet selling firewood storage racks. And, uh, it was cool. You know, I'm a, a big soccer slash uh, football fan, right? So I had a, a website called soccer tools.com back in the day. I was unfortunately in that whole journey of, uh, failed like keyword stuffing, like horrible black hat <laughs> stuff. So, I mean, I've done, I've run the gamut here of internet possibilities. And then I realized that sincerity and adding value, you know, like you said, solving a problem, doing something productive, that, that was the guiding light. Like I, I look back at that person who did all those things and it like, it's hard to believe that that was me 10 years ago or less than 10 years ago at this point. So that that's kind of my, my journey, but to actually answer your question, it's like, where does that fit into my FI life? I mean, unquestionably, once I finally had a site that I could be proud of, which was my original personal finance site, richmondsavers.com, I, you know, I was making a tiny little bit of money, but like I had proved in my own mind that like this could be something like I could scale this. I could figure out a way it's proof of concept. I proved to myself that it was a viable business. And, you know, that was what I needed. And I think, like you said, know yourself. You need to know where you're coming from. And like, for me, I couldn't just do the burn the boats, jump and not look back. Like that was not what was going to work for me. So I needed to have some degree of safety. You know, I had a family, like I knew I had safety because we were so far along the path to FI, but it still wasn't enough. So Anyway, I had tried all these things. I finally got something that could work and I realized a way to scale it. And that was what I needed to make that leap. And, you know, right at that point when I realized I could scale this and that's what led into travelmiles101.com. And the day that site went live was the day I left my corporate career. So really entrepreneurship is tied as inextricably as possible to my FI path. But until you made me verbalize it here, I don't know that I would have necessarily thought it was that closely tied. And I think what's interesting there is that the entrepreneurship journey and the skills you've learned have probably, and I'll ask this as a question, but like for me, it's enabled me to live my life after FI without having a problems of I've lost my corporate identity. Who am I now? Because I already had, well, I just make stuff up. I don't ever call myself an entrepreneur, but I just make stuff up. I make things happen. I do stuff. I launch websites and courses and like bug people on the internet about being on their podcast. Like I do things. <laughs> and then FI was really easy because I didn't really have a transition. I was just doing things. Hey, this is Andrew from the Choose a FI team. Hope you're enjoying the show. We're going to get right back to it after these quick messages. Jonathan's got a completely different 
route with entrepreneurship? Like, how did it tie in for you, Jonathan? Did entrepreneurship help you get to fight? Like, did it get you there? Is it getting you there? Are you coast fight entrepreneurship? Like, we're coming up with a whole bunch of new terms here now, but Mm -hmm. um, how did it work for you? You know, I was thinking back to like an origin there and, and it took me all the way back to when I was in school and I was stuffing my brain full of these facts to make me a better professional in the workforce and, and my profession was pharmacy. And so you have four years of undergrad. By the time I got to pharmacy school, I didn't remember any of the undergrad. And then you have four years of pharmacy school and man, I, you know, I'm, I'm coming out loaded with facts, just all of these interactions and need to know type things. And then I get into my professional career and I'm a glorified, highly paid customer service rep, you know, that's having to troubleshoot insurance companies and fix printers and take my lunch break, hiding behind a narcotics cabinet just for a second, you know, just like, like extended bathroom breaks where you got to go 10 hours at a time. And I'm like, I'm not using any of this information that I spent for the last four years. Like if I look at the 80, 20, I'm getting paid because I hold a license better people don't hold. And because I'm very good at customer service and because I know how to get results with insurance companies, that's effectively what made me better than my peers. Not in any way, my, my knowledge that I spent $168,000 to learn just, you know, let's be very brutal here. I wonder how many people, you know, look back at their education and all the stuff they learned that they paid for and then what they actually do and like very good alignment, very good alignment. So there was a little bit of a sense of resentment and frustration that nothing that I dedicated a decade of my life to in any meaningful way was translating to what I wanted to do with my time. And I think that kind of built up and overflowed into, uh, Brad and I, when we started choose FI, like suddenly I had this outlet where I didn't need to get permission from anybody to learn a new skill. I could just learn it, you know? And so I'm, I'm building a business that's, uh, you know, it's not making any money on day one or day two or anything, but it also doesn't come with any risk. So this is why we use the word side hustle here. There's no risk. There's no debt. There's just kind of, let's start building out content and, you know, how can we make this better? And so, yes, the content is personal finance, but there is a business that's being built, a humble business that's being built. And there's a lot that goes into building a business and you can learn most of it for free if you're willing to put the time in and figure out how to put it all together. And so in parallel to my own FI journey, which was being documented on the show, I was getting a lot of satisfaction from suddenly like immediately being able to learn something, then use it immediately in a very self-serving way. It's, it's my baby. It's my business. Like I go learn something I can now benefit. My business can benefit from that skill that I've just picked up. And so that was like the, you know, it's kind of like this virtuous cycle. It's this loop, this feedback loop that just kept like locking me in and making me appreciate in a very low risk way, this path of entrepreneurship. And that wasn't really tied to the finances at, at that point, but I'm on this five path all the student loan debt has been paid off and the business is now bringing in enough income to cover my core expenses. It's being run as a side hustle. So, you know, I'm doing my full-time job and I'm working on this nights and weekends. And I, now I'm past, you know, I've paid off all my debt and I have several years of expenses actually saved up. And I got to the point where I had to choose, but the choice really wasn't that scary. I've talked about it and I picked the more fun one, knowing that my worst case scenario was that I could just go back, maybe not to the same employer, maybe, maybe not, but I could just go across the street. I could always go back and look how much progress I was able to make when I was just put working on this part-time. Can you imagine what I could do if I could give this more attention and prioritize <laughs> this? And that played out. So, you know, I, I just kind of made the case to my wife and the, and the stakeholders that would be affected by this kind of rambunctious choice. And we dedicated the next six months to a year and, you know, happy ending, happy story. What's interesting there, and and I don't want to get us too far off track, so I'd like to drop this, but then just like kind of come back to it. And it's to me, it's it's worth pointing out. Chooseify has done very, very well over the last several years, but Chooseify also had, you know, a a pretty bumpy 2020 along with everybody else. Uh, It was an impacted industry. And one thing that became very, very apparent to me is that I had built the skill of entrepreneurship personally. I'd become very good at identifying needs and then figuring out what a solution would look like and how to make the solution and then market the solution and then sell the solution effectively. And so one of the things that I did with that skill set is actually built another business over that over that year. And the problem was people need jobs and they don't have the skill set to get in jobs. The solution was I know how I worked with individuals to build a job placement program and that has done exceedingly well. And so I, I just wanted to say that like I put a huge value on 
building skills, even without necessarily a, a, an end game in mind. It's just like you are a more valuable person. You can, you can make the choice. If you do this, you can at some point make the choice to be a more valuable person for an employer if they choose to hire you or just a more valuable person for yourself through the art of entrepreneurship. And so that's kind of my, that's my entrepreneurship story. And it's why I think over the last year or so, you've kind of heard me become more and more passionate about it just generally, because I recognized that it gave me options. And to your point, Alan, I felt like I was able to get some level of identity from this that made the transition from walking away from my professional career almost almost non-existent. It was just, it was just, it was a glide path. I mean, I, I, frankly, I was running for the exit by the time that I left because I was enjoying this so much more. So I do think there is, there, there's something in there that would be interesting for people. And that fellow that we were talking about earlier that said he loved his job. Yeah. He, he may not have needed this, but I don't know if four or five years ago, I would have said that I, I needed entrepreneurship, but when I look back, I was like, yeah, you, you did actually need it. It actually unlocked a different world for you. And it's kind of interesting, just worth pointing out to people that we do all of our five calculations around no longer earning an income, right? So it's like in the absence of an income that you will be earning, you need to save this amount. And then you can basically bank on the fact that this money will then be there for you for the rest of your life. The math kind of changes when, you know, to, to where Brad was on his journey or where I am now, you end up creating your dream business. That's one that you never want to walk away from. And so then you spend the second act figuring out how do I automate this, build systems around it, et cetera, to free up your most precious non-renewable resource, your time. If you can answer that in an affirmative way, all right, I did that. It's kind of like the best of both worlds. So I'm still mentally working through how to organize that. I think it's really important for individuals to go through that that hierarchy of what, why am I pursuing entrepreneurship? Am I doing it because I'm, I'm low income, I'm minimum wage? Well, the good news there is it's not going to take as much entrepreneurship to replace your income. Am I doing it because I am trying to exit my job, you know, and I, and I want to free up more time, et cetera. Then we need to make sure that we're very protective of our time with what it is that we build. Am I trying to do that to have an impact on the world and build my identity on the back end? I mean, when you were saying this, I was like, yes, that's it. If someone had that you know, kind of questionnaire to go through what is your why for entrepreneurship, it would really then inform the types of jobs that you look for. So Alan, in your case, stand up comedian commuting, you know, 90 minutes to go to one play like that is in diametric opposition to your life goals to spend more time with your wife, but maybe a stand up comedy podcast where you build a community around the idea would be totally in line with that. Understanding what is your why and going through this questionnaire, this process to figure out where entrepreneurship could fit now or could fit in the future will allow you to build towards that. There was so much there. I don't know what to pick <laughs> up on first. <laughs> yes. Yeah, one simple question, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> there was so much there. So let's introduce a few concepts for the audience. Number one is the mini experiment. So I think people see entrepreneurship as this big thing. I've got to build a business. But I've spent a long time, and it's actually developed because of the Rebel Entrepreneur podcast, talking about mini experiments. If you have an idea within you, if you've always thought of doing this, doing that, break it down, run a mini experiment for two months, build a free website, put it out, sell it, see if you enjoy it. Because the worst thing you can do is die with the regret in you that I should have tried this. So just have a go. You want to launch a food business? Well, set up a stand in the front lawn, invite people round and sell some food and see what happens. You want to be a comic book creator? Well, start drawing and create it. I don't really care what it is. There is a way to do it without risk, to run a mini experiment and to test and to try and see what happens. And if we're saying to people, like, have a go, because it, like, you never know what happens, I think there is a way to do it without risking your journey to FI, without giving up your job, and then to see if it works for you. And just to give you one brief example of that, we've started this thing called the coaching series on the Royal Entrepreneur podcast, it comes out every Thursday. The current series is a lady called Jamie. She's an artist. And her first two episodes were, I want to do art. I've got a full-time job, but I don't know, like, how, <laughs> what, what type of art? So we boiled it down. We spent about three or four episodes going, what do you want to do? And then eventually decided she wanted to do a comic book. So like, what's the risk-free way of doing a comic book? We'll run a Kickstarter and we'll pre-sell it. 
So we set up the Kickstarter. We started to pre-sell it. I'm not going to spoil where it goes because like, you'll see where it goes. You can listen to the podcast. But in terms of that, she got to test her dream job as a side hustle and to see whether it worked or not. And I think for everyone listening to this, if you have something in you that says, I want to try this, I want to do this, like run a mini experiment and have a go because the number one regret of the dying is I wish I'd had a go. I wish I'd stayed true to myself. I wish I'd had a go. Like, don't leave that inside yourself. Just have a mini experiment. Yeah, Alan, that is, uh, that's so profound and it rings so true for my own life. Like as you were describing that, like, you know, do you lose your identity when you leave your corporate career or is there that moment of doubt? And for me, it was never even amidst, as I was saying in all those in my story, like amidst all those quote unquote failures, like it never felt like a failure because I didn't tie my identity to I'm an entrepreneur or I'm a firewood storage rack seller or, you know, I, I thought of myself as somebody who's experimenting and trying to figure it out. So like the, the, that's the exact way that I looked at it. So it was nothing but fun. Right. And like all of these, as you say, like these mini experiments, like for me, I, I looked at them as mini in terms of dollars invested. There was virtually no downside. I mean, maybe, I mean, I probably broke even over a seven year span. So like I, I probably didn't even lose any money, but at the worst case, it's a, a couple thousand dollars. Like I can, and that was just very intentionally like hired somebody to write articles that, you know, like some absurd number of like $10 a pop or, you know, something ridiculous this was in like the, the spammy days, but like there was no downside. It costs virtually nothing to run these experiments, certainly in a digital world. And even as you described previously, even like a pop-up restaurant, like you can pre-sell, like that was such a paradigm shifting moment for me that like everybody thinks of a restaurant as something that, oh, that's going to cost a million dollars, right? Like you have to basically sign your life away and there's still a 90% chance of failure or thereabouts. Like who, in my mind's eye, like who the heck would ever take that on? But to you, it's, hey, can you borrow someone's space? Can you pre-sell these? Can you run a one night pop up and pre-sell, right? Like it, what if you made it so you couldn't possibly lose? Isn't that a cool framing question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I left Alan Donegan speechless. That's <laughs> well, I think it, everyone listening to this can have a go. Yeah. Like that's the bit. And I actually believe that like if you could imagine your journey to a financial independence in percentages, like you're 10% of the way there, 20% of the way there, 30% of the way there. It's a really interesting question to ask. And the further you are along that journey, the more protected you are from things going wrong. So if you get to X percentage of the way long and you have a mini experiment, it doesn't work. Like, never mind. We're on the journey. It's still working. And I think if you set yourself up right, this actually helps. And Millennial Revolution, who I love, Christian Bryce, part of their advice is follow your passion is bad advice. They say, do not follow your passion. Get your finances straight first. And I've, I've thought long and hard about that. And it is a fascinating, fascinating thing about the follow your passion. I think Christy wanted to be an author and your chances of being a professional author and making money are so slim, it's unbelievable. And your chances of actually making any decent cash out of that are nothing. But if you have a job and you do it on your side, there's no reason why you can't build it up. And she actually started, she started whilst she had a job, but then she really became successful as an author after she got to financial independence. For all of us listening to this, I think the opposite advice, if they're saying follow your passion is bad advice, well, following your non-passion is also bad advice. Like that's generally go and find the suckiest job you could ever imagine and go and do that. I think that's that's dreadful advice as well. And it, it's not an either or. You have a breadth of options. You can choose something that's exciting and makes money. And I think I'd love to say this to everyone out there. Doing good and making money are not mutually exclusive. Doing good and making money are not mutually exclusive. You can make money 
or as my friend would say, you can make bank whilst doing good. And I think people have got in their head that if I'm going to go off and be an artist, I can't make any money. If I'm going to go off and help the kids and change the world, I can't make any money. And it's just not true. There is a way to do both. So I think this false dichotomy of thinking that we create for ourselves, that I either follow my passion and don't make any money, or I do like the standard thing and I make lots of money, just isn't true nowadays. I want to ask you this question about um, creating a job versus creating a business, or maybe it really is just a question of a job versus entrepreneurship. It's not necessarily a problem to have a goal to create a, a job for yourself, but I do think some people do not consider the implications of that. And they think that all types of entrepreneurship are created equal and they don't realize, you know, they were going into it with this goal of entrepreneurship. And then they have this epiphany at some point in time, they've created a job that's unrelenting. And <laughs> I'd be curious for individuals that, uh, you know, are kind of have this fear or maybe have this slight nagging feeling that what they're actually working on is building an unrelenting job. What are some best practices to avoid that or some things to watch for going into it? I did exactly that, Jonathan, and I'm kind of done it again. I've now set myself up to do two podcast episodes a week on the rebel entrepreneur. And I'm like, whoa, I've created this beast of a show that needs feeding every week. And I think it happens in cycles. So Let's just, I'd like a definition between business and self-employed or business and job. And the definition I use is called the revolver test. Have you heard of the revolver test? No, I actually have never heard of that. Tell me more. So I know a lot of your audience in the US, so do not actually do this. This is a thought experiment. This is just a mental experiment. And the experiment is, imagine putting a revolver to the person who runs the business head. And you pull the trigger and they die. This is a thought experiment. If the business dies with them, it's not a business. It's self-employed. It's a job. If the business survives without them, it's an actual business that runs without them. And it's called the revolver test. And the idea is you get to a point where you've passed the revolver test and the thing you've created operates without you. Now, the podcast that we've built together, The Rebel Entrepreneur, You've enabled me to do it. I've started building it. If you shot me today, please don't actually do this. I will um, not do that, did, I will not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm somewhat nervous. Um, it would die with me because I've not set up the processes. I've not got someone else helping me with it. Like, I am that thing. And the same with Rebel Business School, which was pop-up business school for years. Like, without my energy, it was me. So I started to do experiments. Katie and I went off to the US for a month. Uh, I was running the event with Mr. Money Mustache at his headquarters and we traveled around there for a month and then we came back. And I remember being very angry and disappointed because it felt like nothing had happened with the team whilst I was away. Like literally nothing had happened. And we had quite some challenging times when I got back from both point of views. They're like, Alan's got back and he's annoyed. And they were like, we've been doing stuff. And I'm like, nothing's happened that needed to happen. And that proved to me that we were nowhere near the revolver test and being able to do it. So then we put a load of things in place. I did another mini experiment when I went off to LA to write a movie for two months. And I literally vanished from the business. And then I remember going back with Katie and uh, we had the welcome home meeting with the team. And I was like, OK, looking at the finances, we've made a loss whilst I've been away. And our first thought was we haven't invoiced people. And that wasn't the case. And then the second thought was, oh, we just haven't done enough business. So if I stayed away, it turned out no one checked the finances whilst I was away. Not once. No one checked. So we would have completely failed the revolver test the second time. So then we did another round of learning. And did another mini experiment, but it actually took probably two, two and a half years to pass the revolver test. So my thinking is it's absolutely fine to build yourself a job if it's something you like. I, I like doing the podcast episodes, so I'm going to keep doing them. And actually, I don't want to give up. I don't want to make it work without me because I enjoy it. At some stage, that will change. But it's fine to build a job if it's what you're doing. But it's important to know the difference between an actual business and a side hustle, a self-employed, something that you just do on the side. And maybe you're just building a side hustle 
because you're going to transition after a while and it'll replace part of your income and it lowers your FI number. Because if you can make 10 grand a year, that's a quarter of a million. You don't have to save based on the 4% figure. And you've built yourself a little job side hustle. All right. So this is a, a much deeper conversation, but I really did glean some information from that. And I'd love to, to make sure our audience latches onto this. Most entrepreneurship, most small businesses that are started by an entrepreneur start out as a job. You are carrying the product, right? Like it's, it's everything you're doing everything. So almost every small business started by an entrepreneur will be a job. The question is, was that the end goal or over time, are you going to look to implement this revolver test? And are you going to go from being the product to building an actual business using, you know, the advances that you've made in your chosen niche. And there are so many different aspects that you're probably going to need a bookkeeper, right? Alan, Alan found out that someone has to be accountable for the finances. Someone has <laughs> to be accountable for sales. Someone has to be accountable for product or service delivery. And so if you never take that approach, you never think about that, then five years from now, you will be all of those people and it will be maddening because you will have more customers, hopefully, you know, you will have more customer service and you will have more complicated finances, more, more complicated partners that you're working with. Like it will bury you. So for any entrepreneurship, what it's going to be one of those things where what got you here won't get you there. And you can't afford to just be really, really good at the service part or the product part. When you're, when you're talking about entrepreneurship, you're talking about building a business. Now it is a job and you are, you are filling that role. You're filling probably five or six or seven different roles. But at some point, you got to bring those core team members in to help you out. And that's going to take a transition. It's going to take an actual process. And this is what you're describing now. And the revolver test, which maybe we could just talk about a rotating door test, something like that. Uh, <laughs> it just gives you, it gives you a litmus test to say, when I rotate out, did someone else rotate in? Did someone else pick up the slack there or were they carrying it the entire time? The actual service or the idea part, a lot of people get that. But then if you don't figure out the scale piece, if you don't figure out the how do I bring people in piece, you're going to be on your own version of a treadmill. And Alan, what strikes me is it worked, right? Like that's the funny thing is in your mind and to all reality, it worked, but you didn't truly have a business. At the end of the day, it was the Alan Donegan show, right? Regardless of whether, <laughs> you, you know, you, you, you called it that or even conceptualized it that because you were so important to so many aspects and that business is so much stronger now because it's, there isn't that single point of failure, you in so many different aspects. And my business partner, Simon, like we both did different things. Right. So when you removed me, there was a big Allen shaped hole and they actually spoke about the Allen shaped hole, which is a weird expression, uh, but there was an Allen shaped <laughs> hole when I went disappearing. Sometimes it looks uh, like a taco, sometimes a donut, sometimes a burpee <laughs> machine. Sometimes a pizza. Yeah, yeah. It's not good, Jonathan, not good. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think it's, it's really important. One thing I would love to say to everyone here, there is such a drive to scale and grow. And every entrepreneurship course talks about scale and growing. I just say, you don't have to, like, you don't have to, if you like what you do, let's say you run a gardening business and you like going out and mowing the lawn, doing the garden for the people down up and down the street or in the local area. And you've got to FI and you're doing it like three days a week because you enjoy it. Like you don't need to scale that business because it's just what you do. It's fun. And I think this meaningful work component of FI, one of the biggest failings of FI is that most of the people who are following it are doing it from away from motivation, i.e. they're moving away from a job they hate and they've got nothing to move towards. You need meaningful stuff to do. Otherwise, you get to retirement and you're like, what do I do with my life? And there's so only so many margaritas you can sip on a beach. I don't even drink. There's only so many smoothies you can sip on a beach before you get bored you lose energy, you start to become depressed. And I've seen this so many times. You need something to move towards. And I don't care whether it's looking after the grandkids, creating a side hustle, writing a blog to educate people. And I mean, it doesn't really matter what it is. But I think FI doesn't really include the what am I moving towards piece. We've started to talk about it a lot more, but it's heavily away from motivated. 
we just recently did an episode where we were talking about this idea of the Mexican fishermen. So I, I, I really hear what you're saying about a job not needing to scale, but it goes to what is your why of doing that job? So being very clear on that and that why is going to look very different for different people. So if your why is to create a, a business, a passive income stream, then you need to, you need to move from job to business, you know, otherwise it's trading your time for dollars. And then on the flip side of that though, if you are having an impact, it's an active service, it's something that you get fulfillment and enjoy. And you are fine with the fact that at some point, even if you don't, if you don't enjoy it, if you're going to unwind it, the business will then just disappear along with you, along with your endeavors, as long as you are kind of intellectually honest about that on the front end, then that also is then fine. But again, knowing what is your why of entrepreneurship and how does entrepreneurship fit on your path to financial independence will inform the energy that you put into building or not building a team. Entrepreneurship can be a tool to get you to financial independence. Entrepreneurship can be a transition tool that you're most of the way there and you start to then transition out of work. Or entrepreneurship can be something you pick up after you've got to FI as something to replace and create purpose and meaning. And really, it's just a, a bunch of skills and you go out there and do some stuff and solve some problems and have some fun. And for me, it's become a way of life because you get to meet incredible people, do incredible things, and you get to build a life that you would not be expecting. Like the magic that comes from taking action, the magic that comes from running a mini experiment, who you'll meet, what you'll do. Like the magic of doing stuff. Too many people think and they don't do. So if you're listening to this right now, like my rallying call is stop thinking, start doing, because the magic is in the doing. So let's go back to this fellow that messages you, you know, several years ago after, after episode 30 and says, Alan, you've got me all hyped up, but I want to know, like, should I be doing entrepreneurship? Like I, I make a great income. I enjoy my job. Like with the benefit of kind of this more nuanced conversation that we have now, do you still feel like you gave him the best answer or would you add some new, cause I bet you there are other people that are conflicting. Like, I don't want to, do I let go of my dream? Do I let go of my dream? <laughs> no, the answer, you know, my answer to that. No, no, never. I just would say to this fellow that, that messaged you, like, it's not, it's clearly, it's not as simple as yes or no, or even what do you need? I think the answer can be, what do you want? And what are your goals? And know that like, you don't need to use it as a tool to get to FI, right? But it doesn't necessarily rule out that entrepreneurship that's increasingly getting like momentum in your heart you recognize that you have a suit of armor that armor is that that momentum that you've made on your path to financial independence you can take risk and turn it into opportunity right and maybe at some point keeping in mind that you want to spend more time with your kids you start thinking about if i continue to feel this call what would this next phase look like and what could i build in a way that wouldn't pull me away significantly from my kids or slow me down on my path to fi you know do i want to do it at that 80% point like alan was just pointing out or do i want to do it on the other side but don't just rule it out because humans we were born to create and we we are you know whether that's creating just for interest or creating for entrepreneurship creating for income if this is something you want to do you can do it in such a low risk way and you can do it in a way that doesn't have to take up all of your time and I think my advice has become more nuanced as I have got older. In the old days, I was very much like, entrepreneurship is the way. Come on, do it. Yes, go. And as I've got older, it's gone, well, okay, what season of life are you in? What finances are you in? Like, where are you? Then let's figure out what you want to achieve, what type of life you want to live. Then let's figure out whether entrepreneurship is the tool to get you to the life you want to leave. Now, see, that's a conversation I'd love to hear on Rebel Entrepreneur. You should reach back out to him, have him on the show and have that conversation. How fun <laughs> would that be? That would be amazing. Uh, I love those conversations because actually I regularly have them and I ask, so what do you actually want to achieve in life? How do you want to spend your time? And it's really interesting because quite often people will say things like, well, I want to go traveling or I want to spend time with my kids or actually, my main goal is to own a 12-seater table that I can have the family around every night. I don't want to go traveling. I want to be in one place with the family having dinner every night. And depending on what your goal is, will depend what tool, what business, what you create, what you do. But I think most people don't ever consider that 
they don't even think what life do I want and then build the stuff that gets you there. They just get excited about stuff or actually they don't do anything. They just stick in their job and don't do anything. But it's actually like starting from the end result. And one of the expressions that has been reverberating around my head for the last five years that I repeat on the Rebel Entrepreneur ad finitum is the extraordinary belongs to those that create it. So the extraordinary belongs to those that create it. So if you want an extraordinary life, people aren't like wandering around handing them out on the street. You don't just get given an extraordinary life. You have to build it. And then that leads to a really interesting question. Well, what is extraordinary for me? Because extraordinary for Brad is different to extraordinary for Jonathan. Extraordinary for me involves tacos and views of the sunset and wife and whatever. It's different for everyone. And then you go, well, okay, that's your definition of what extraordinary is in this season of your life. Let's go and create it. Let's go and build it. Let's go and make it happen. Because I genuinely believe everyone listening to this, you can build any life you want if you're willing to pay the price for it. So let's decide what you want to build and then get going. And this idea of if you want normal results, do normal things. And then you kind of look at what's normal. The normal is to go out drinking each Friday and Saturday, to buy an expensive car, to buy a four bed house and to not exercise. That's a normal life. And if you want normal results, do normal things. If you want different results, do different things. If you want extraordinary results, do something extraordinary. And that's where it starts to get really interesting is let's do some extraordinary stuff, run so many experiments, do some tests, and you will start to live a life that's very different to the one that normal people live. And you will have some fun along the way. So Alan, huge thank you for coming on the show and everyone listening to this. Definitely check out Rebel Entrepreneur. You will see these ideas get brought to life on a weekly and now bi-weekly basis. And let me encourage you, if you're thinking about a place to start, maybe you start with this big idea, the extraordinary belongs to those that create it. You can find that episode, that podcast linked in the show notes for today's episodes. Alan, thank you so much for coming on the show, my friend. It's a pleasure. I love coming on your show and your passion to help people reach financial independence I would love people to go out, take action, work on becoming financial independent, and then come and hang out and eat tacos with me. That would be excellent. He means that too. You should definitely take him up on that offer. <laughs> All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. Make sure you subscribe to Rebel Entrepreneur on your podcast player of choice. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. If this episode was helpful to you, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends about us. We can be found on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. While you're there, don't forget to check out our other shows like Everyday Courage with Jillian Johnsrud and Rebel Entrepreneur with Alan Downigan. If you would like a free bite-sized course to jumpstart your financial independence, check out chooseify.com slash challenge. Chooseify is produced by Andrew Mendonza and Zachary Tan and is a production of Chooseify Media Incorporated. Chooseify.com is managed by Annie Sheely with William McVeigh, M.K. Williams, Melissa Lagerquist, Liz Kessler, Stephen Hettig, Kelly Black, and Jennifer Ma. And Ed T. is our CEO. Thanks for listening.